Come on in. Welcome. Uh, I'll wait a second until people get a seat. Uh, welcome to session 18A of CDOIQ 2024. Um, this is the 18th year, my 16th coming to this event. Um, yeah, I'm feeling pretty stale right now. Uh, we've got a pretty cool discussion now. We've been talking all week about, in the public sector track, about uh, legislation and impacts of legislation on data and AI policy. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the impact of Gen AI on the marketplace. Um, today, we're going to have a pretty scintillating conversation about uh, where the money's going. Um, I'm going to turn it over pretty quickly to Michael Hauser, um, a colleague of mine from SAIC. And Michael's going to lead a panel and introduce his panelists on how to follow the money and a view from the seat of of uh, data and AI from the seat of uh, venture capital investors and startups. You're on. Great, thanks so much, Justin. Uh, it's great to meet all of you and to everybody uh, dialing in online. Thanks for that too. Um, I'll introduce my, my panelists in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna start this with a little bit of uh, in the room participation. So for all of you here today, you get to participate. Um, virtual, you know, we'll, we, won't, we won't push on that, but can someone guess how much VC investment, dollars, in just this last quarter was made into AI and data startups globally? Somebody guess. Is it in the trillions? Somebody guess. <laughs> and I'll repeat the number back out. Just shout it out. 500 million. What else? 50 billion. What else? 30 trillion. Okay, we got a big spectrum here. So my, you actually almost nailed it. Uh, Krishna, so depending on whose data you trust, and none of the data is good, um, 50 to almost $70 billion invested in AI and data startups globally this quarter. Well, actually not, because when you read the numbers in the way it's reported, they put that as the headline. That's actually the total amount of money in all startup investment in the last quarter, but they re it's really weird what PitchBook and C CBI did. About 30% of that. So when you're you, not AI, you're not exactly. <laughs> so I give you that lesson because there could not be a frothier, more irrational space in venture right now. Right? So roughly, roughly 15 to 20 billion dollars if you read into what they actually wrote in the last quarter into data A and I investment. Now, a lot of that is in a very few amount of deals. Right, XAI, you know, any day now, Grok is going to announce their raise. Right, we're talking hundreds of millions to billions into single companies. That's not what's going on here on the stage. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I wanted you all to have a sense of like the irrationalness of this space right now, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the rationalness as we get into the discussion. So, Dan, Logan, what I'd love for you to do, and Logan, I'll start with you. Um, maybe if you could introduce yourselves to everybody, talk a little bit about what your firm or your company does and how you fit into this space of AI and data as it relates to government customers. Oh, yeah, happy to. So I'm Logan. I'm the founder and CEO of Data Logs. I started the company, I guess, about four years ago now. Prior to that, I was working at JetBlue, the airline, and of course, data. And uh, so my job at JetBlue was managing large amounts of BI reports, analytics, data products. And as we got more and more users in BI, it became very, very messy. We had hundreds of people creating different reports, dashboards. Things were failing to refresh. There was so much duplication, lots of stuff going unused. So I ended up saying, OK, I got a lot of free time on my hands once COVID hit the airline industry. I'm going to try to solve this. And so I built a little minimum viable product, is what they call in the startup world, but an MVP. And I spent about six months on it, and it went viral on Reddit. And I was like, wow, OK, I'm onto something here. I go to my job. I quit the next day. And then it ended up taking about 18 months before we made any money. But uh, we stuck with the journey. And then uh, now we're about a team of 22 people. We did 8 million in funding last year. A large part of it was funded by Dan here from the Squadra team. And then particularly on the uh, public sector side, well, I think everyone in this room knows, but the Department of Defense public sector is one of the largest users of data in the world. And with that comes more BI products, data products, people creating different insights. 
So our company's plugging in to help manage that at scale for large organizations. But yeah, I can turn over to Dan now to introduce yourself. Yeah, hey, uh, great to meet you all. Uh, Dan Madden, uh, National Security Principal at Squadra Ventures. We are a VC firm focused on early stage national security and cybersecurity startups. Uh, my own background, I served in the Marine Corps, worked on the Hill for a few years, spent several years at the Rand Corporation doing modernization studies for the Department of Defense, uh, did some more time in the Pentagon, and then decided I want to do the opposite of that. Uh, moved up to New York, started working with startups, and, and got to meet great, great people like Logan. Um, Along the way, I ended up, uh, particularly when I was at the Rand Corporation, uh, doing a lot of work, kind of operations research, using a lot of the, a lot of the data that the Department of Defense uh, was producing, whether from sort of the tactical edge, or whether having to do with finance, personnel, uh, org structure, uh, readiness, and got to see how central that was to the way that the Department of Defense not only manages. Uh, their budgets, but also their how they think about the future of conflict, investment, uh, and keep all the trains running on time. Um, so when I met Logan and got to learn more about what he was doing, it was, it was pretty exciting, and I guess somehow that resulted in me getting pulled into this. So great to meet you all. I'm Mike Hauser. Uh, I'm part of our partnerships, products, and ventures team at SAIC. Uh, a large government systems integrator. Uh, our group brings commercial capabilities and technologies bundled into full solutions to government customers that we sell full and open commercial to help accelerate those capabilities into government mission challenges. We've learned by doing this over the last four or so years, you know, we've grown this business from a few million, you know, it'll be um, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of business, hundreds of millions of dollars of value created for government customers this year that you know, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna bring this integrated solution like a Dairy Queen Blizzard treat to a government customer, because that's what they buy, right? They don't wanna go buy peanut butter, wrap that peanut butter with chocolate, go find milk, ice cream, syrup, then go buy the blender at the Walmart, that's our labor, and then have to manufacture that solution, that, that dessert themselves. They just wanna buy the outcome of the dessert. So that's what we're doing. Um, and we've learned the hard way with good and bad lessons of doing some venture capital investments over, over those years that when you don't look into, and I, I mean this lovingly, Logan, you know, a, a middle school maturity company, right? they've got a lot of promise, they've got some revenue proof points, they're like my 14-year-old son. When you don't take the lens of an investor to those kinds of collaborations, you can really make bad integration decisions, not technology integration, business integration. And so what we're trying to do is bring the value of being a venture capital investor, picking the right team, finding the right business model, wrapped around the go-to-market with the right technology ingredients, et cetera, et cetera, and pick those opportunities when they're earlier stage to bring that rapidly into government mission challenges and get that deployed on real missions beyond the pilot or the proof of concept, but to bring it to scale. Because what we can do at SAIC for a startup is be the path to many different, almost B2B-like sales across many different government customers where we see the real demand signal across lots of government agencies and then help accelerate the path into those solutions across those many different customers, across those many government agencies. And then that benefits us because it becomes something that will differentiate SAIC in the ecosystem. Um, and so we're really trying to bring mission value, the outcome of an integrated solution to our customers, super quick through commercial offerings. And the VC lever is just one of those that we pull, and I lead the investment team. Um, so I wanted to kick off and, and maybe start real, real big picture. What, what do you guys think some of the biggest um, opportunities are in government for AI and data? What are some of the problem statements, uh, some of the use cases? and and maybe how, how is it similar and different from B2B when you try to do B2G? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. So the layer that my company sits on and focuses on is basically everything after a data warehouse. So how data is ultimately being used by end users, people creating different analytics, insights, data science projects. And one of the biggest fundamental changes that we've seen on both the commercial and government side is of course there's AI embedded into more and more products. So your Power BI's of the world, Tableau's, Click, 
there's now these AI type capabilities within the BI tool themselves. So if you take a SAIC entry level analyst or an intern for a project, hey, Mike wants uh, the last six months of investment history, how are our companies doing? They might have had to go investigate that process, gather the data, build a template report. Now, all of that can be done in seconds. It's much faster in terms of creating that kind of templatized version. It's nowhere near perfect, but it gets you almost 80% of the way there. And for our commercial clients, what's that resulting in is endless kind of sprawl and data products and creep there. So we're seeing faster time to insights, more value being produced, but then also that volume's increasing, which is leading to more compute, more complexities, a lot of wasted and duplication existing in these different data environments. So that's one example that I think has fundamentally changed kind of in the last about six months of what we've seen on both the federal as well as the commercial side. And then uh, in terms of the other part of your question about what's the biggest difference between the two, uh, I'd say overall the problems are very similar. People want to get their hands on data, create more insights. Uh, for us as a startup, the selling process though is very different. Our average enterprise commercial sale takes anywhere from four to six months. And this is for contract sizes typically from $75,000 to $450,000. On the public sector, uh, it requires a lot more time and effort from our team of understanding where is this budget coming from, what's the actual procurement cycle look like, what are all the stakeholders involved. And the biggest difference in my mind, and my background's commercial, not on the public sector, is just the number of stakeholders involved in between the two deals. And Mike and Dan probably have more expertise in that than I do. But on our public sector deals, I feel like we're talking to 30, 40 people, yeah. where on the private sector, uh, sometimes more, uh, we can get a deal done with 8 to 12 uh, people in the room involved and get things moving on an accelerated timeline of four to six months. But yeah, that's uh, my initial thoughts on that. And just to set the stage, right, you've got Logan, we'll go back to the school analogy here, right? R ran this journey from like pre-kindergarten into kindergarten, met Dan, getting into elementary school. Dan, you know, helping companies grow up through those elementary school years. SAIC, right, we're mature series A into series B and beyond. We're like solid middle school investors. Lots of potential, but boy, and this is like my 14 year old son, right? Lots of risk that in high school you could really screw this child up. Um, and so this, this evolution of a company is really, really, really hard and really, really important when you think about a startup, particularly with a government customer who, I mean, maybe to be polite, we talk about them as persnickety. And Dan, I'm wondering if, you know, since you sit on both sides of this table, you've been in the, in the pointy-sided crazy building <clears throat> known as the Pentagon, the biggest national security customer on planet Earth, the largest budget in the United States government when it comes to IT and everything else. Can you maybe talk about both sides of this from the investor's perspective and, and maybe even from the customers? You know, what are the good opportunities for, for startups and data and AI and government? Yeah, so I, I guess I'll, I'll start by talking about the federal market and then I'll, uh, how it differs as a customer and then talk to the, um, the, the problem space. Uh, so in, in terms of how it's different as a government, yeah, it, as you alluded to, and it's like a $800 billion, just for the Department of Defense alone, that's a $800 billion um, annual budget and growing, which is kind of an alarming thing, right? Uh, I think that's something like uh, a quarter of the discretionary spending of the, of the federal, federal uh, budget. Um, in terms, in term, I, th I think probably the biggest, the biggest thing is what Logan already touched on, is that the decision-making process is just a lot more complicated. Because actually, it's a lot bigger organization, right? So the Department of Defense, a million people on active duty in uniform, a million civilians, contractors, a million reserve uniform people. It's a really, really large organization, substantially larger than just about any other kind of customer that you're gonna be engaging with. And so the decision-making process doesn't get more agile with the scale of the organization that you're talking to, right? Um, and so that, that ends up adding, adding time and complexity to the decision making. I think to the Department of Defense's credit, uh, particularly uh, the now departed um, former Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, going back to sort of 2015, 2016 time period, the Department of Defense recognized 
that some of the most important and exciting technologies for the Department of Defense, whether from an operations or business perspective, were coming out of the commercial side. Uh, if, if you'd gone back you know, 20, 30 years, then most of the R&D in the world really um, uh, was being allocated by the U.S. Department of Defense. And that, that changed dramatically over the course of years. Uh, and so the, the Department of Defense over the last five years has been making a very concerted effort to become a more agile buyer. Um, it has gotten much better at getting to the pilot phase of acquiring new capabilities and, and technologies. It has not gotten great yet at the scaling those pilots and fielding those capabilities to the force as a whole. Uh, in terms of kinds of problems that they're, they're wrestling with, uh, in terms of operational data, this is actually work that I know SAIC is, is involved in. In terms of operational data, some of the, the key trends are the entire battle space is getting instrumented. You know, whether you're talking about individual soldiers, whether or not you're talking about the platforms, whether or not you're talking about the proliferation of satellite constellations in uh, low Earth orbit, there's a lot more data coming in. Um, the balance of analytics, uh, with, with that increase in data, there's a need for increasing, uh, an increase in analytics at the edge, an increase in amount of bandwidth required, uh, an increase for uh, both the data processing, storage, and analytics for making sense of all that at a, at a, at a higher level of abstraction. Um, so those are all meaningful challenges. And this, getting back to the complexity of the buyer, many of those aren't actually technical challenges per se. Many, many of those challenges are actually kind of go-to-market challenges from the perspective of the startups because no one person, no one organization actually owns all of that. And so the Navy has one vision for how they want to approach it and, and solve that problem set. The Army has half of a vision for how they want to solve that, that they that they think they believe in, but they're not quite sure. The Air Force has high conviction around their vision, but nobody else does. <laughs> and then, you know, the combatant man, meanwhile, is thinking, gosh, if, if a fight breaks out tonight, the person with ge uh, responsibility for actually executing, um, for managing forces in a real fight, like, actually wants a solution like today. So, so just for everybody else in the room, Dan, if I'm counting right, DOD as the customer, and then you broke that down into Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, four customers. Then you broke it down into combatant commands within them, so now I'm in N factorial beneath them. It yeah. sounds like you're really saying like in the DOD, this is actually a lot like B2B. It's, there's, there's hundreds of customers there for companies and startups. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, so it's not a, it's not a, uh, a monolith, it's a polyarchy. There's mo multiple sort of, um, uh, constellations of, of forces and power. So the bad news from like a national interest perspective is that's part of the reason why it's so difficult to scale solutions. The good news from like a startup perspective is actually that uh, you can kind of do some venue shopping, right? There's multiple sh uh, shots on goal. Um, even, even with, particularly if, if you're targeting sort of the, the business side of things, um, you know, there are, there are not only the military services, but there are major commands underneath them. So there, there are lots of, lots of ways you can tackle go to market. Um, on, on the business side, the kinds of, in terms of business data, um, I think it's probably fair to say that the federal market is a little bit behind where the commercial market is in terms of data infrastructure and analytics. Um, so a lot of great opportunities there as well. I think that's a, a, a great point. You know, we find at SAIC, most of our customers may come to us with a exquisite mission challenge, and we've got to walk them back to fundamental data management solutions, right? Our, our Tengen solution for low-code, no-code, our Covers solution for data security, the many zero-trust integrations we do on data just to unlock the potential to go do a mission data challenge like we've done at, at, with the Air Force. Um, and I'll be a little careful in the storytelling here, but there's a mission challenge. We were brought to move data across cloud echelons, right, from the lowest ILs to the, you can't imagine how secure it is above IL-6. 
and also across coalition partners like U.S. and foreign. Um, and we've built the only cloud-based command and control infrastructure that moves data up and down and across. And the only reason we've been able to do that is because we made a venture investment in a company called Zage Security that made their bones because of the colonial pipeline hack, right? A data challenge on things like valves of pipelines that when they were installed with a SCADA network, didn't even know the internet exists, let alone a user. So how do you do user ID management on a system that doesn't know users exist, right? That's what Zage Fabric does. I see a lot of head nods in the room. You must not run IoT systems. Well, when you go to try to create the secure cloud network, our technical wizards figured out, what if we treated it like IoT? So Zage Fabric is an absolute unlock. Now this is something, and this gets back at your point of there are many, many, many different customers and their needs may be the same. That's the value that we as a systems integrator can bring to a startup when we take this enterprise perspective of a large enterprise like the DOD and maybe even the Department of Treasury that doesn't have national security mission challenge, they have business outcome mission challenges and we support them both in secure and resilient cloud. We can now bring startups these great customer opportunities where they can be the peanut butter in the Reese's peanut butter cup that the Defense Department or the Treasury Department will never buy on its own, but they'll buy the Reese's peanut butter cup blizzard. And so now they're great sales opportunities to be part of an integrated solution into a customer. And, and that's kind of the value proposition we're bringing into these mission use cases like that high security cloud command and control use case or a treasury apps in the cloud use case that are very, very different. And I'm wondering, Logan, if you can talk about a couple that you've seen that are just, you know, maybe not even super sexy, but super, super valuable um, with this sort of BI sprawl challenge you're solving for. Yeah, one of, uh, I guess, the biggest changes we've seen recently, and uh, we actually just had a member of our team uh, who joined us recently. He came from the Air Force. He was a lieutenant colonel there, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sinikowski, and he was in charge of building out a large part of the data mesh for the Air Force. And a large piece of what he was doing was trying to figure out how can we get data enablement, data tools on the hands of every single airman within the Air Force. And uh, I don't know if it was three months ago, maybe it was a little bit longer, uh, but they came out with that every single airman in the Air Force will have access to the power platform on their laptop. And what that means is, okay, people now, I guess the previous state was you couldn't even get data and access to it. Now you have access to a BI tool, Power BI tool, where you can start creating any kind of insights you want. Now that's great for data literacy, great for driving mission outcomes, gonna make it so much easier to be a truly data-driven organization starting at the bottom level instead of solely relying on contractors, other things to come in, build specific mission-driven uh, platforms and data and different products. So now anyone gets access. But the risk inside of that where we're kind of positioning ourselves for at data logs is now that anyone has access, you're going to go from 10, 20, maybe 100 reports to likely 20,000, 30,000, 40,000. In the scale and size of the Air Force, I wouldn't be surprised in three, four years if there's a million plus reports, dashboards, data products out there floating around. And then on top of that, everyone switches jobs around every two years. <laughs> so all this stuff is going to become unused, using compute, and your costs are going to go up. You're going to have to be upgrading licenses, capacities, tiers. But these kind of problems where you're enabling, there's AI in the room, more people are getting data access. I feel like that data literacy challenge that has been a stopping point uh, over the last five, six years is slowly being peeled back to kind of this new wave where, OK, we figured out how to get good data in the hands of a lot of people. Now we're finally able to unlock insights. And now the question and what my company solves is, how do we put the guardrails on that to make it sustainable, work long-term without problems? So it sounds like in government, in just a few short years, right, running your business on your Excel spreadsheet, which was fine for an airman to do before, and then they move to another job and the airman that takes them over uh, doesn't even know that Excel spreadsheet existed, so they build a new one. Now you're gonna do that in the cloud with storing compute and workloads um, I'm sure Amazon and Microsoft and Oracle and Google, if they get their IL stuff together and maybe, maybe IBM someday too, um, they're going to love that. The CIO and the CFO won't, and there's maybe down the road a great opportunity for observability, management of sprawl, and so forth, but we're not there yet is what I'm hearing from you. What about, what about you, Dan? What are some of the, the big opportunities in startups right now? Yeah, so... Uh, 
Yeah, and to, I, I guess there's sort of two different, it's, it's worth sort of distinguishing between the kind of the operational side of the military and, and the business side of the military. Um, in terms of, of big opportunities, you know, if you can, if you can be a part of the solution uh, to the, the problems that I was describing earlier of how to make sense of the battlefield, then there's, there's going to be a big opportunity uh, for you. Um, there's a lot of, there's already some major players in the space, including SAIC, Anduril, Lockheed, that are, that are all trying to provide sort of the, the sort of uh, theater scale kind of solution. Um, but from everything that I hear, uh, the solutions have been coming forward so far are still, for the most part, optimizing around pieces of the problem. And there's, we still haven't gotten to a, a fully holistic solution. Um, and, and meanwhile, while, while we sort of struggle with a sort of theater scale solution, uh, folks at a more tactical level don't have any kind of a solution. Um, so there's that. Uh, on the, and then I, I guess to, to sort of abstract from the, the sort of business use case from a, from a DOD perspective, thinking about um, the tech stack itself, right? Whether from applications, uh, you know, algorithms, infrastructure. I think right, right now, um, in terms of the, the algorithms, I, I, I'm a little bit influenced by what I saw happen with computer vision uh, in the Department of Defense. Uh, one of the last sort of waves of AI hype in the national security space, I think, was revolving around deep, uh, deep learning, machine learning, and one of the really obvious use cases was computer vision for, again, helping to make sense of the battlefield. And for the most part, you know, there were a lot of startups that went into that space. Um, and the Department of Defense gave a lot of them like interesting pilot level of funding. And ultimately, in terms of who the big winners were that came out of that, and eh, like for the most part, it kind of still felt like a lot of the either defense primes or some are some of the somewhat new newer defense primes, um, but certainly it's, it's tough for me to see a lot of, um, see any clear winners that, that were really just focusing on the algorithm. So the ability to, to, to really more own the platform, to providing like a full business solution in terms of like an application that has an impact, direct impact on your, your end users uh, is probably more promising than developing a better algo. Um, you know, when you talk, look at the generative AI space, it's probably a little bit of the conventional wisdom is that you're going to end up with a, a relatively small number of winners that will end up with a somewhat sustainable advantage, um, uh, you know, whether that's open AI. Um, and then the infrastructure layer, I think that a lot of that is is in churn right now <laughs> as, we, as we shift over from really well-structured data to applications uh, that require processing of unstructured data. Um, so th those are some high-level thoughts. So without sharing too much about our investment thesis, maybe I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the pillars of it. Um, and when we talk to other investors, be it Squadra, um, that are kind of NatSec focused or true dual use investors, um, Andreessen, Incutel, um, or even some of the pure play, um, I would say B2B SaaS investors that are kind of looking at national security and government agencies, be it Virginia, state of Virginia IT, which we serve, or the Department of Treasury or the EPA, right? There literally isn't a government agency we don't work with at some level that's federal and we work with many states. Um, you kind of think of the foundational layer of infrastructure and it's like AWS store and compute and then all the new novel hardware providers. Um, you know, Grok has been in the news a lot lately that you know AWS may buy or compete with. So you have all that foundational store and compute. Then one level above that you have like the open AIs and the Anthropics, right? Building these massive expensive models. Um, I think Google's last model um, cost them if I remember the number correctly, $191 million to train. Um, OpenAI, ChatGPT4 costs $78 million to train. That's just storing compute costs. 
right? That, that that's boggles my mind. Um, like you'd want to talk about a capitally intensive business at that part of the AI stack. And then you get up to the infra infrastructure layer in it, right? It's, it's the snowflakes and it's the Databricks and it's the data IQs and you go on down the platform layer with n factorial number of companies, right? Many of those are downstairs today. Um, then you get, you know, the, some of those bespoke models, um, right? This is like the lifestyle businesses down the road here, you know, MIT PhDs that wrote a really cool imagery algorithm that's gonna meet that one national security customer doing geospatial intelligence over stuff in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it worked really well, but now we're not in Afghanistan and Iraq. You don't need to figure out, you know, is that a person in a turban with a Kalashnikov? Is it a person in a turban with an M16? Because that matters. Because <laughs> you might be able to tell their provenance and are they friend or foe based on that data alone. Well, that's less relevant if you're now in a theater in the Pacific where nobody's wearing turbans. But you wrote that algorithm that's able to pick that out. Now that's irrelevant anymore. So there's, there's that specialty algorithm stuff versus more broadly applicable. And then you get mission apps on top of that, right? You get those different layers. Um, we are exceedingly <laughs> bullish on as unreasonable amounts of money get spent at the bottom of the stack, like we were talking about earlier with the frothiness, how you can get really smart answers closer to the top. Um, and then, because there are many, many buyers in the DOD over into other federal agencies, that's just government. And if you're a software company, maybe that's 20% of your TAM and you've got 80% somewhere else how you can make those need states be much more common and similar at those upper layers of the stack and help those companies grow faster. Um, you know, we really think that's an untapped environment. We read in the news all the time, SVDG had their NatSec 100 this week. There was articles in the Wall Street Journal about a billion dollars to spend at the Department of Defense with startups, and it's patently wrong. And they all know it because you can't see the data, right? Those are only prime contracts. Companies winning the big things, the, the, the prime contracts that government agencies let, not all of the money that goes into what are called sub-Ks, right? The people that flow through companies like SAIC or Lockheed or Raytheon, and we all happen to be venture investors too, right? If it, Lockheed talks about this in public, over 60% of their revenue is spend to suppliers. When I was at Boeing, it was closer to 70%. It's massive amounts of money that come through and into all of these companies that win the big prime contracts that then become great sell through channels and sell with channels for startups. And that tends to happen at that mission app layer at the top. So there's a ton of value um, to be created there. And it becomes looking for the common things rather than the one-offs of that computer vision algorithm. By the way, we think um, there's a lot of unpacked potential in imagery just to, 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 to put it out there relative to things like LLMs and Gen AI, um, because there's so much mission application there that is untapped, and you don't need the problem of, if I'm gonna use OpenAI's model, now I give them all my data, let me tell you, no government customer is gonna let that happen. By the way, their data is probably partially on-prem and in the cloud, so you gotta deal with that too. So, you know, OpenAI doesn't apply, you can't use it. Um, you gotta get to maybe Meta's models, which you can take on-prem or other things. So you really got to think carefully about how to knit together that underlying infrastructure to enable the mission apps on top. And that's what we spend a lot of time with our customers trying to wrangle um, and build them you know, their unique version of the Dairy Queen Blizzard, more like the off-the-menu item um, that, that you might be getting from a hamburger stand in California when you know everybody else is, is ordering the double animal and you ask for it a little bit special and they can make it. That's what we do. Um, yes, I'm big on food references, if you haven't noticed. Um, so let's maybe pivot the conversation. Um, and I mentioned earlier, right, three different stages of gestation here. Super early, a little later, a little later, as we go down the line here. Maybe, can you tell, go back to your, your origin story, Logan, and talk a little bit about what you think the factors were that made you attracted <coughs> to a very well-known and respected venture investor to your right and others, um, and what it really meant to like show value in that community, not to your customers, but to investors. Yeah, happy to talk through that. I guess we had two very different fundraising experiences. So last year we raised $8 million across two rounds. One was a 
seed round, and then one was kind of between seed and Series A. And so still both very early. But I think the big difference between those two rounds is, one, we were going to pitch with very little revenue, very little traction, and really selling our envision of the company of, hey, this is how we believe the market, this is why we think it's different, and this is why we're the team to succeed and actually build this. And for that round, uh, that's the round that Dan's fund, Squadra, led. Uh, but to actually reach Squadra and others to land that investment, I think we pitched around 94 venture funds total. And majority of that either said no, or just didn't respond after a couple conversations. And so it took us about six months with kind of iterating on our pitch each time, getting better and better. And eventually uh, we were in their office in DC and uh, doing the pitch, we expected, okay, it'll take another couple months to get back to us. But in that meeting, we were able to stand up, get a handshake deal done. And then a few months, maybe a couple weeks later, they wire us a $3 million check to start building out a team. And this was going from three people just getting started, figuring out what in the world's going on in the market, how do we position our product, what are we actually gonna build long term. And I think the slide where we really kind of flipped them or made them interesting is we showed them all the sales conversations we had had so far. So we had 20 different companies' logos on this slide. And I told them, hey, you can call any company on this slide and verify this is a massive problem. No one's solving it today. And if we had a product that actually worked, they would buy it. And I think they called one or two of those customers and both checked out. We were fortunate they called the right ones and kind of put <laughs> some strings behind the scenes to make sure uh, we had the right people rooting for us. So that was the first fundraising experience. And then the second one where we had a little bit more proof points, traction in the markets, uh, funds actually started coming to us. And as soon as you start telling VCs no, they get more and more interested. So people started flying to our office, wanting to chat with us more. We said, hey, we're not raising right now. But eventually, we met a fund we really liked that had kind of similar background where there's some on the federal side as well as the commercial side and very, very successful. And uh, so we met uh, this gentleman named DJ Patil, who was the US chief data scientist and now leads uh, the Great Point Ventures Fund. And he wanted to lead around in our company. And we couldn't say no, and eventually landed on a price that uh, made sense to us. So they wrote the subsequent check into our company uh, last year. So now uh, that's where we're at so far. And then eventually, our goal is to go from the, I'd say, kindergarten, elementary school grade to towards the end this year, graduate up to middle school, and then uh, peak Mike's interest maybe in two or three years uh, once we hit high school. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Um, so in, term, in terms of, let's see if I can bracket this a little bit. So we'll invest from like sort of good idea stage through, um, through Series A right now. Right now we're investing out of Fund 2. It's a $110 million fund, so we'll write $1 to $5 million checks. Um, we're raising Fund 3, hoping to hit an initial close of that next, next quarter. That'll allow us to write up to $15 million checks. Uh, and start executing on more of an early growth up to Series B kind of investment strategy. Um, in terms of what we're what we're looking for, you know the you know the first sort of screening criteria, right? Is, is it on thesis for us? Is it uh, is it either you know something to do with cybersecurity or, or does it somehow touch on national security? Do we? And my very pragmatic way of operationalizing that is. In, ter in terms of your goals for what you want to achieve out of this raise, does part of that entail significant revenue out of the federal government? And if the answer to that is yes, then we've got some, some conviction that we can be helpful to you in that journey. Um, in terms of more substantively, what are we looking for? You know, looking, looking at the team, the market, the product, the growth strategy, fin uh, the finance strategy. Uh, in terms of team, you know, is there sort of strong t uh, founder market fit? Are these sort of the, the extraordinary people um, that are going to have some kind of uh, unfair advantage in in build in in building the product or selling the product uh, on the market side? Uh, on the market side, is it a big enough market to to build the size company that they want to build? Is it a heavily competitive market or not? Um, you know, what, is the, what do the competitors look like uh, in, ter in terms of the product? Does it have like a really clear value, uh, value proposition to the customer? So when we're doing these 
these sort of customer calls as part of our diligence process? Are we hearing, do the customers themselves actually appreciate what the business value of the product is to, to their business, right? What are the unit economics? Is it, as this thing scales, is it gonna grow into a healthy, profitable business as they achieve some, some measure of scale? Uh, on the on the growth strategy, you know, what what does the go to market look like? Uh, who are the the key customers that you're going to be going after? How are you going to reach them? Um, in terms of finance strategy, do do we think that we're we're capitalizing this business the right way in order for them to achieve the the business and product milestones that they want to before they have to go out and raise additional capital to continue on the growth trajectory that that they're plotting out for themselves? Um, so at a high level, that's, that's how we think about it. Um, for for post-investment, I kind of touched this on the front end as like sort of a screening criteria. Do we think that we're going to be able to be materially helpful to you? Um, you know, we, we only invest where we can lead or co-lead, so we take a board seat and we, our, our, our team meets with the founder uh, and the founder's team on a very regular basis, almost bi-weekly to weekly sometimes. Uh, figuring out where we can dig in and, and be helpful. So, thanks, guys. For you know, for us coming in at that middle school level, um, and when I think about Dan's categories of, of classic VC diligence, right? Team and talent, customer channel market, product market fit, product and technology, business model and financial plan and business case, go to market, marketing, etc. We're really relying because we are a co-investor. We're not going to lead rounds, even though we'll write one to five million dollar checks like Dan is writing, because we don't want to take on the fiduciary responsibility of a full board seat. But because we're so revenue cogeneration focused, we can be very validating, and we've done some diligence with Dan and other co-investors together on the same call, where we can be very clear proxies for customer need, customer demand product scaling potential and so forth, because that's in part our job. Um, we are enablers to that with our startup portfolio, right? The sales, marketing, business development teams at Zage, Morpheus, Orca, the three investments we've done to date, are our best friends there. Yeah, we know the tech teams too, and it's because we're bringing back different items that need to get on the technology roadmap and need to get prioritized because, wow, to serve that customer that doesn't need FedRAMP, you're a SaaS company and you need to create this thing called private mode on-prem. And wow, Orca Security, you need to go help us offer that for this big $1.6 billion acquisition program. Can't tell you who it is, but we want it. And we smoked two of our biggest competitors on the tech volume because Orca was requested directly by the customer in their final RFP documents, not the capability, the company. And we were gonna be the only one to bring them. Now, that's not the reason we want a $1.6 billion government contract delivered Orca their largest sale ever, their largest single revenueing opportunity. There were 11, 12, 13 other big things in that technical solution that we had architected and engineered. A Dairy Queen blizzard, right? It wasn't just the peanut butter cup from Orca. Um, so for us, it's really about relying on other co-investors' diligence on certain of these other dimensions. Typically, it's the earlier stage investors who have done that and stuck with the company from the seed into the A and the A into the mature A or B, and that's where we're gonna come in at the mature A or B, or maybe a little bit later. We really count on the business enablement capabilities of a bona fide VC that they're gonna be there day in, day out. They're gonna be there on the board because we don't have the capability to do that as a strategic investor, right? We're not an off the balance sheet fund that takes money from many other limited partners, like even some other CVCs do, right? Like Airbus Ventures does that. My alma mater at Boeing Horizon X, now that it's part of AEI, they do that. We are a sole GP and LP. We are a strategic investor on behalf of SAIC's business strategies and growth aspirations. So we've got to count on other co-investors to help with that. Um, and it looks like we're getting ready for the Q&A, Justin, because you're standing up. Yeah, here comes the, uh, here's the hook. I'm going to pull you guys off stage. No, uh, this has been great. Uh, we do have a few minutes for Q&A. We've got about 150 people online. 
and the people in the room. Um, I don't have time to get the, to the online questions, but if anyone in the room has a question you'd like to ask, I'm here for the microphone. And by the way, as you're doing that, for folks online, um, Justin, like, let's just get him to us after, and we can yep. figure it out that way, if that's okay? Absolutely. Super. Sir? Yeah, I have a question for, I guess, anyone on the panel who wants to take it. But uh, as you're, you know, as a startup, um, looking at things like potentially going after a government contract or government customer, what are the things that would drive you to pivot because of the compliance needs in order to sell to them, the potential architecture changes to your product in order to sell to them? What would drive you to make that pivot uh, outside of just like a signed contract? P pivot into or pivot away from the federal? <laughs> pivot into. <laughs> okay. yeah. so, so I guess the first thing I'll say is the best thing is for it not to be a pivot. So that private mode thing I talked about earlier w with Orca, um, you know, their largest TAM is not government. It's other markets. Um, they learned after they built that with us because we kind of figured it out together that it unlocked a whole line of business in other highly regulated customers that have a lot of on-prem cloud security need because they run true multi-cloud hybrid. Um, so the first thing I would say is don't look at it as a pivot into. Look at it as how can this enable me to? Because if you pivot from B2B to government, you're now a government contractor. Most, most, not all, investors look at if government's your only customer or a majority of your customer as decretive. What we're trying to show investors is how government can be accretive. Now, there are certain kinds of government contracts that most investors look at, like SBIR, SIBRs. You discount that right away. It's proof of concept. It's pilot funding. It's designed to do R&D and development. It's not that it's bad. It just isn't ARR, which is of a much higher quality. So th those are some of the factors we consider. What about you, Logan, on the other side of the table? Yeah, just to add, uh, I think if it's the same core problem that my company is solving, we'll change the infrastructure behind it. We'll change and support and staff how the customer needs, as long as it's the same core problem. But if they want a different solution, different problem, I think in the sales process, we try to figure out that early. And we say no more than yes. I guess we both have to align, but we don't make changes to the core problem we solve or product for a singular customer unless it's part of our vision roadmap and it's going to help us accomplish our goals longer term. So I think one of the biggest mistakes that uh, entrapped startups fall into, and we've been pretty close to falling it to a few times, is you become a service company rather than focused on your core product. And as soon as you do that, you're not backable by these guys because they don't count service revenue. It doesn't count towards your ARR. They said, why are your margins so bad? And so we focus, we want it solved by our core problem. And, and we would love for the startup to just give that to us because that's a lot of what we do, right? We're, you know, I mentioned about how much business we're doing a year. We're almost a $7 billion company. That hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue is cute. It matters, it's high profit, but it's just cute. Um, so I think a big value proposition, more broadly speaking, of coming into government is consider how some of the integrators can take off some of that risk and load, and you can collaborate with them um, to find the paths into government. Yeah. What about you, Dan? The, and I think you guys all hit on, on the main things. The, the only thing that I'd add, um, I think one way my thinking has changed over, over the last couple of years about services revenue, um, you know, I, I, th I won't dismiss it out of hand, right? Like, I, I think for a lot of, a lot of if you're selling into like major, whether it's B2G or, or, or B2B, like B2 Enterprise, um, a lot of times the customer is not going to be as sophisticated as you are about the technology. And you're gonna have to invest in some services initially in order to get to the, the right integration, in order to get to the customer education. And it's almost sort of a case by case, um, sort of business case analysis as to whether or not the business outcome justifies the, the scale of distraction associated with the with that that services um, the level of services effort associated with it. Well, great. Thank you, guys. Oh, I have one more question. Uh, really love the discussion. I think the perspective from the corporate VC and the VC and the startup are fantastic. 
Um, uh, especially I like Michael, the analogy for the teenager grow up. It's kind <laughs> of like a rapid uh, and also very radical like evolution from the infrastructure, architecture, and a different layer of the tech for big corporate, government, or startup. So my question, would love to hear some insights on, let's see, uh, are there, let's see, from the technical due diligence, commercial, uh, business, all those like a financial due diligence, especially a lot of uh, like uh, AI startups are like a challenging to pivot with the value creation for business for especially long term, right? Beyond the uh, pilot, what are the productivity or scalability? So there are a lot of questions there. So how you guys see the value creation? Are there some measure of <laughs> metrics that you guys check on, especially maybe from corporate VC, you guys have in-house development power. Yeah. So compare between uh, organic growth or inorganic acquisition or investment, how that can be, or from VC side, uh, maybe the metrics would be different uh, compared to yeah. corporate VC or so, start. Yeah. So, so Thank I, you. Logan, you were talking earlier about some of this sales data you just got and what you may be able to do with that to help your prospecting. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I guess we've been through kind of two pretty thorough diligence processes. And the first one was, I'd say, pre-product market fit. So there was very little technical diligence on our product. I think they met our CTO, discussed what that looks like. But it was largely focused on our customer pipeline, sales, speaking to almost every single customer that was interested in our product. And I'd say it was more qualitative than actual quantitative data that drove that decision. And then once we became a little more, uh, I guess, product market fit, had some revenue, then it became around, okay, current revenue, is it gonna stick around more than a year? How long can we forecast these deals until? Uh, what does growth look like month over month? Then there was also more technical diligence, where I think we had different subject matter experts tear apart our product. And our feedback is always, as investors go through, yeah, we can add that in, or that's not an important feature, don't worry about it, it's coming one day. Uh, but I think we get away with that stuff because we've been at uh, the ele elementary level so far in our stage where as we grow as a company, the expectation is just our product gets better and better. But it's really focused on that vision we have and backing that with real customer data at that point from my side. Just in, in terms of where the focus and diligence is over the course of, of going out for different raises, it's sort of pre-seed level, it's sort of a... It's, it's the vast majority of it is about the team and the vision. And then by the time you're going out to raise a Series B, that's really about whether or not you've developed like sort of replicable, scalable sales motions for the thing that, that you want to build. In terms of the mechanics for how you diligence like those different um, sort of components of analysis that I identified before, you know, on the, on the team, like that, you know, you kind of look at their records of what they've built before. Um, whether from a business or a product perspective, uh, in terms of the, the product and, and the technology. And for myself, particularly investing at seed stage, it tends to be about investing in founders that are literally the world leading experts in building the thing. That's part of what gets me excited about it. Um, you know, when, when for this one semiconductor company that I, that I invested in, um, you know, the, the, the person who wanted to go out and build it, you know, the CEO was the person that invented the technology. There wasn't anybody who understood it better, right? Um, for, you know, for Logan, he had been, he had been both, he had deep domain expertise. He'd been the data guy over at JetBlue. He'd experienced the pain point in terms of the kinds of technology that he was, that he was developing. Uh, given the team that he built around himself, we had high confidence that he was gonna be able to get there with the kind of capital that, that we're allocating to them, so. And, and I think for us, you, you take all those things having already been done, and you have to look objectively at, you know, Logan, the person who understood the business fundamentals of this BI challenge, because you were the builder of it at JetBlue. Well, now Logan's got to change by the time Logan gets to Series B. This is coaching, by the way, <laughs> right? Now you're, now you're, the problem's been solved. There are tech people on your team that do that every day. You probably have someone else who you have to give that up to now. Can Logan be the person to build a high ARRing, high growth company and lead that? 
and understand more about the vagrancies of sales cycles and satisfying investors and all these other things and still love the problem they fell in love with at the beginning, but now be the mature owner of a grow, rapidly growing business for us, seeing that you know maybe that founding team has changed a bit. Maybe they've been through their second or third sales leader because it's very different selling pilot proof of concepts to AFWorks than it is selling 16 EULA backed. You probably don't ever even get to get to that level of hands-on work with a bunch of different government agencies plus banks plus pharma companies plus plus. It's a very different type of sales organization. And so we've got to observe for those success factors at a different level of maturity. And at that point in time, you know, all the stuff you read about online about what it takes to pitch a VC and so forth, it's all out the window. Absolutely out the window. I would, I would say that if you want to learn how to be a VC by all the, the testimonials and, and, and things you see on YouTube and online, you're learning about what it means to get to a Series A fundraise. Fantastic. Um, thank you guys for the questions and the uh, fantastic information and insight. Um, next up today, in about an hour and a half, we have a panel on the future leaders in data and building the next generation CDO office, so please join us for that. In the meantime, Mike and Dan and Logan, thank you for your time and coming all the way here. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Justin.